Let's start where it started, in the sky above Siberia. Down there is Tunguska. The area is larger than France, but its entire population could fit comfortably into a modest football stadium. I'm traveling with some unusual passengers. We've squeezed into the helicopter alongside four reindeer and a handful of nomads. And they, in a way, are the lead players in this story. Just after seven in the morning on the 30th of June, 1908, their forefathers witnessed something incredible happening in the skies around them. There was thunder, said one eyewitness. The earth began to move and rock. I saw the sky split in two, said another. Fire appeared high and wide around us. It became dazzlingly bright, as if there were a second sun in the sky. Something had exploded with the force of a thousand atom bombs. But what was it? Other strange things have come out of the forest during the long search for an answer. From science and beyond science. Nineteen oh eight, the year the explosion happened, was a very different world from ours. Cities were becoming modern. But the revolution in transport and communications that would shrink the world had hardly begun. In America, the Wright brothers had carried their first passenger for less than half a mile. In Russia, the Tsar was still on the throne, though there were already rumblings of the revolution that would finish him. In Edwardian London, People went confidently about their business, but for one strange phenomenon. Luminous clouds in the sky above the city, so bright, said the newspapers, that you could play tennis in the middle of the night. But no one connected the stories with an event a few days earlier and 5,000 miles away in Siberia. A hundred years later, almost to the day, I was on a charter flight bound for Vanavara, the nearest settlement to where the explosion had happened. All I'd been told to look out for were mosquitoes. Local leaders had organized a welcoming party on the runway. Technically, this is still the homeland of the Avenki nomads. The welcome was a curious cross-cultural pantomime. Even the lad dressed up as Nevenki shaman looked suspiciously Russian up close. The vodka disappeared in seconds, so there was no point hanging around. Soon the bosses were heading one way, while we set off in the other 
to see what the settlement offered. Manavara is not exactly the end of the earth, but it's not far from it. Beyond the village, even the mud roads stop. But today is special. They've laid on some local colour to keep the visitors happy. Apparently jumping is a popular sport among the Avenki. Certainly keep you warm in winter. The Avenki people once roamed wild over much of Siberia. This was their land for herding reindeer and for hunting. These days, they're like most conquered people, hanging around doing not very much, while the settlers run everything. It was all a bit like a film set. These reindeer, I found out later, were a long way from home. Though on the day, they seemed happy enough to stand around like starlets, being photographed and fed. Round the corner, we found Slava Ivanov and his mum. Her parents were alive when the explosion happened. And for them, there's no mystery about it. The gods were angry. The Russians are adamant that there's no record of anyone being killed by the explosion. That's why they think it's okay to mark the anniversary with fun and games. But the truth is that no one came to investigate for nearly 20 years. So it's hard to see what those records are based on. Catching a helicopter around here is like catching a bus. There are no roads outside the settlements, no railways. If you don't fly, you stay put or go on foot. The media caravan is being taken towards the place in the forest which they've calculated is the epicenter of the explosion. The odd thing I've discovered already is that most people I talk to call it the Tunguska meteorite, 
and then argue all day about what it really was. All they agree on is that it happened, whatever it was, on June the 30th. The governor of the Evenki Autonomous Region is the man on the left. He's trying to make an announcement for the cameras. Well, actually, it's not, as someone points out. He's doing it for us, of course. The news teams are a long way from base. Can't have them missing their deadlines. Apparently, it's a bird and a thunderbolt rolled into one. What takes your breath away is to think that none of this, neither the anniversary celebrations nor the continuing mystery surrounding the original event, would have happened without the almost superhuman efforts of this one man. Virtually alone, he converted the great explosion from tribal legend into a mystery for the modern world. About 700 miles from Vanavara is Tomsk. In 1908, it was an important outpost of the Tsar's Siberian Empire. A local historian showed us a plaque recalling its days as the hub of the pony mail. Oh, this, is, um, this is the beginning of the regular postal communications along the, the greater Siberian tract. That was my producer, Teresa, talking. We had contacted Eduard Majdanuk to see if he could help us find something in the archives that would show whether the local newspapers had even reported the explosion. Finding the precise date is tricky because the Russians then worked off a different calendar, which ran 13 days behind the rest of the world. Then he found what we were looking for. This says visitation, somewhere like visitation from uh, heavenly regions. Middle of June, remember there's different calendar those days, near eight o'clock in the morning, um, not far from the railway line at Filimonova, which is near Kansk. What happened? A huge meteorite. William Imagine Higgins. a story like that today. The media would descend en masse. But in 1908, it disappeared without trace. Well, almost. In the room next door, Alia Boyakina was unwrapping a parcel. It was a photograph album that belonged to a man called Leonid Kulik. In 1908, Kulik was 25 and under police investigation for distributing revolutionary pamphlets. He didn't have a clue about the explosion. But 13 years later, he stumbled across something that would change his life. This picture is important because in it you see a little calendar of the year. It had anniversary dates or events that happened on those dates. <laughs> that Kulik was now. Printed on the back of that date was the story we'd see next door. Kulik found out that there had been a Tungusk meteorite. Why had he not known beforehand? She says it's because it happened so far from civilization that it went practically unnoticed apart from one or two reports, but no one paid the slightest attention to them. Seismic stations all over the world did register that there'd been a huge explosion, because the shock waves from it went twice round the globe, 
Then it was noted on the calendar, on the 30th of June 1908, that there'd been a huge meteorite somewhere in Siberia, but where exactly, nobody knew. The album gave tantalizing glimpses of the man. Soldier, student, family man, explorer. We wanted to know more. Alia told us that his daughter, Irina, was still alive. Why didn't we ask her? I got out a map. There's Europe over there, where we started. From Moscow, it's then a four-hour flight across Siberia, here to Tomsk. To find Irina, we now needed to catch the overnight train to Krasnoyarsk. Just beyond it, you can see the town of Kansk, which that newspaper story was talking about. Vanavara isn't marked on the map, but it's another 600 miles or so, up there by the river. In Kulik's day, rivers were pretty much the only way to get around. And they still are for many people in parts of Siberia. We found Irina on the banks of the mighty Yenisei. She's in her 80s now, bright and breezy. Her first memory of her father was when she was three and out for a walk in the park. She noticed a man looking at her strangely. So I said to my nanny, who's that man looking at me like that? She said, go and say hello, you know him. And I said, no, I don't. So I went timidly round the back of where he was sitting. But he couldn't contain himself any longer, jumped up, scooped me into a huge hug and began kissing me. That was my first memory of my father. He'd just come back from Tunguska. He was still wearing the clothes from the expedition, and he had a big, bushy beard. Kulik's transformation into an explorer was an unexpected byproduct of the Bolshevik Revolution. For the best part of a decade, Russia had been in turmoil. First war with Germany, then revolution, then civil war. Throughout most of that time, Kulik had been in the Russian capital, somehow hanging on to his job in the minerals and meteorites section of the Academy of Sciences. That's why he was so interested in the story on the back of the calendar. As it happened, my father was just preparing for a trip to Kansk and then to Krasnoyarsk. So when he got there, he asked around for people who'd seen something and talked to many local people. Then he distributed masses of questionnaires to find other eyewitnesses. Kulik, on the left, soon realized that the Kant's story was little more than barroom gossip. The real story was much bigger and much further north. He persuaded his boss to let him go and investigate. There's no film of his first trip. This rare archive is from the following year, when he did have some help. But he told his daughter about his first trip when even finding a guide was a problem. Eventually, this man agreed to go with him. This Evenki was invaluable to them because he had reindeer. They'd found it impossible to get through on their horses. But he also had a wife, a niece, a baby at the breast, his herd of reindeer, and it was a whole caravan that set off. It was so slow. By the time they got up, made the tea, gathered up the reindeer, this, that and the other, it took them nearly a week to get there. And then, because it was February, March, that time of the year, the nights set in early. So they'd soon have to stop, 
find a place to pitch their tents, put the food on to cook. And so although the actual distance wasn't that great, it took forever. After a week or so, they finally found what Kulik was looking for. It was astonishing. Nearly 20 years after the event, thousands of trees still lay in neat rows on the ground, scorched and uprooted by some huge natural force. The Evenki took him to the edge of the fallen trees but would go no further. He said, that's as far as I'll go. The shamans have forbidden it. There's a taboo. Kulik went on alone as far as he could, but he was weak with illness, exhaustion and hunger and soon had to make his way back to Vanavara. One afternoon, I tried to follow his trail into the forest. After a long walk and up a steep hill, I found what I was looking for. Well, these are the last remains to be found of the explosion it left behind. Nearly everything has grown over since 1908. But these trees are a reminder today of the extraordinary scene that Kulik must have been greeted by when he arrived here in 1927. You can see how they're uprooted by the force and laid out in straight lines by the blast. As tantalizing then as it is now. What on earth was the cause of that blast? Or should I say, what in the universe was the cause? It was the sight of these trees that convinced Kulik he'd reached the spot where a massive meteorite had landed. For the next 10 years, this settlement of Vanavara became the base for his attempt to prove that case. Vanavara was just a small place then. It's only now that it's a big settlement. At that time, it was just a few buildings where local hunters could get their ammunition and supplies and trade in their pelts. But he was good at making friends with the local people who mattered, and they helped him a lot. And so now did the new proletarian state. Kulik's exploits were a perfect advertisement for the power of the people's science. So they financed new expeditions to trawl the bogs for traces of a meteorite. They paid for surveys to calculate the epicenter. They searched high and low for a crater, but all they got was mosquito bites. He would tell us about how awful the mosquitoes were, huge. And they'd work in great leather gloves and tie women's scarves around their heads. They looked like scarecrows, and you can see in the photographs, they're wearing mosquito nets. He told us about all this, but he never complained. On the contrary, if anyone else complained, he'd tick them off, saying, why can't you just put up with it? Abandoned after the explosion, Vanavara began to be repopulated soon after Kulik's first trip. We went to see one of the oldest inhabitants, Valentin Zabotsev. His parents knew Kulik quite well, and Valentin himself seems to be made of the same durable stuff. He grows the food he needs to eat. He cuts the wood to build his house and to keep him warm in winter. And this is the car he's built out of odds and ends. 
Да, тут с разных деталей и свои детали. Если хотите, я вам ее покажу. Покажи. Она у меня служит уже 23 года. 23. 23 года. И без всяких ремонтов. Агрегат с мотоколяски СЗА. Для инвалидов были эти коляски где-то выпускали в 60-х лет. Наверное, где-то так. Транспорт был еще более примитивным, когда Валентин's family came here in the 30s. Сталин was making peasants all over Russia give up their land and join collective farms. When his commissars set one up at Vanavara, Valentin's parents had no choice in the matter. Шли пешком, вот 200 километров через эту тайгу без сеток с маленькими грудными ребенками пешком. He remembers how Kulik would drop in on his way to search for his meteorite. Да, прямо он даже приходил к нам. В гости? Да, значит, вот, где родители жили, он заходил, даже вот, ну, как вы зашли, вот, как говорится, поговорили, он поспрашивал, потому что мать практически с отцом помнили вот это вот потрясение, значит, падение вот этого метеорита. Они помнили? Они жили на, в Кежме, на Ангаре. Там даже окна с домов повылетали в то время. Значит, программы хала, и главное, что потрясло землю. Кулик's meteorite theory was accepted by most people in those days. But the absence of evidence was puzzling. Four times Kulik went back to the wilderness to search. It was a vast undertaking, over 800 square miles and 80 million fallen trees. But at its center, no crater. What he did find was much stranger. Dozens of trees still standing, but with all their branches ripped off, leaving them like telegraph poles in a land without telephones. Kulik was planning a fifth trip to the forest when Hitler invaded Russia. At the age of 58, he volunteered for another bout of service in the Russian army and died of typhus in a German prison camp. But he had opened the doorway to a mystery which was to take his fellow Russians on a strange and unexpected journey. The longer the explosion remains a mystery, the more the theories have multiplied. Some now think the planet was hit by antimatter or a black hole. Others say the explosion came from within the Earth. Some even think it was deliberately triggered by an electrical impulse from America. So now they just call it the Tunguska phenomenon. Слава Богу, человечество еще не знает таких взрывов. Десять водородных бомб в одном месте, в одно мгновение. Поэтому, естественно, люди бегут туда, интересуются и поклоняются. И люди и религиозные, и научные, всякие. Это естественно. Павел Флоренцкий's uncle Kirill was one of the early pioneers. He represented established Soviet science. But another key player was Gennady Plekhanov on the left here. Plekhanov now lives in a small flat in the middle of Tomsk, filled with the mementos of a lifetime devoted to the Tunguska mystery. The young enthusiasts have grown old on summers in the forest together. He went over to his bookshelf to get something he said would explain what drove the post-war generation forward. 
It was a story written by someone called Alexander Kazantsev. Это рассказ Казанцева взрыв, который был опубликован в 1946 году. Ну а есть потом вот издан здесь. Это уже советская фантастика. What excited Plekhanov and most of Russia was Kazantsev's idea that the devastation had been caused by a nuclear explosion on board a spaceship from another planet. Наш вертолет улетает на юг, откуда полвека назад примчался гость из космоса, чтобы сделаться тайной для жителей Земли. To understand how this extraordinary story took off, you have to understand the times the Russians had lived through. First, a terrifying end to a terrible war. The phantasmal swirl of atomic energy soars upward in a column capped by a mushroom shape. A whirlpool of elemental fires rising to 60,000 feet. The blast that turned square... And now they felt isolated, fearful of hostile American power. We in panic, here in Moscow. We want peace. Enough, we fought. And that's why we were so happy to accept the inhabitants. We want to be friends with the inhabitants. We are the people. This... One such seeker of alien friends was this man, Georgi Gretschko, later a hero of Soviet spaceflight. He was still at school in post-war Leningrad when the Kazantsev book came out. I took a card, looked at where Tunguska, where Leningrad, and started planning an expedition. But I planned it on a train, then on the river, and then on the river. Но я тогда сказал, что я обязательно туда приду и буду искать, вот это, обследовать это место на предмет, не взорвался ли там корабль, не осталось ли там что-то. And in 1960 he did. By then Gretschko was a member of the top secret Soviet rocket research team centered in Moscow. Its leader was a brilliant and shadowy eminence of the Cold War called Sergei Karolyov. Gretschko and other enthusiasts on the team knew another expedition was being mounted to search for remains of an alien spacecraft and were desperate to be on it. Нам денег не хватало на самолет, но мы пришли к Королёву и сказали, что вот есть такая версия, что это был космический корабль, и мы хотим исследовать. Он сказал, что я Могу вам дать несколько солдатских пайков для, для питания. Двух дам солдат с рациями, чтобы держали связь между вами и базой. И еще, говорит, вам повезло, я в Красноярск отправляю вертолет для своей дочерней фирмы. Так вот, этот вертолет пусть сначала поработает на вашу экспедицию, а потом, когда вы закончите, он улетит в Красноярск. So with Karolyov's backing, they set off to join Plekhanov's expedition. Это мы, группа людей, посвятивших свой летний отдых исследованию загадки Тунгусского метеорита. Поиски продолжаются потому, что тайна остается тайной. А вот что касается настроения, настрой был боевой. Найти дюзу космического корабля. Ну, мысли, естественно, что вполне возможно, что это был космический корабль инопланетян, что они летели к нам на Землю, что взорвались на посадке. Даже нам было лучше думать, что это был беспилотный корабль или что там сидел робот, потому что жалко было инопланетян. By a strange coincidence, an Italian, 
who now plays a huge part in the current research into Tunguska, had, like Gretschke, spent the war years at school in Russia. Giuseppe Longo is now a professor at Bologna University. His parents were fiery Italian communists who sent him to Moscow while they were either in prison or leading partisans against the Nazis. So he understands exactly why the Russians took Kazantsev so seriously. Many people think about Kazantsev only as a science fiction writer. Really, he is an engineer. So, in '46, when the Soviet government sent to Hiroshima and Nagasaki a Soviet delegation to study the effects, Kazantsev was a member. And what Kazantsev knew was that the Nagasaki bomb had exploded above the ground, not on impact. Looking at the ruins, he realized it had uncanny parallels with Tunguska. He had seen some building that were still standing near the epicenter of the explosion, because there the shock wave came vertically and uh, not, uh, do not put down all the house as if the house was at a certain distance. And, and so, so there were some walls still uh, standing up. The same was in Tunguska. It was that observation that really led Kazantsev to his theory. If the trees had been flattened by a mid-air nuclear explosion, it must have been generated by aliens, since no one on Earth knew how to split the atom in 1908. In the context of the time, it wasn't quite as wacky as it sounds now. Flying saucers were being spotted all over America. Why not in Russia, too? In the 50s, they sent in the space the first Sputnik. They sent the first men in the space. So many people were thinking, if we can send in the space our people, while why the Martian or uh, people from some other planet cannot send something on our planet? Все-таки было такое убеждение, что-нибудь найдется из космических. Ну а зачем бы мы иначе шли? Тогда я их ждал и в полете посматривал иллюминатор, не летят ли. И сейчас жду все вот. It was rather a relief to find myself back on a perfectly ordinary aeroplane. Or as perfectly ordinary as they get round here. They didn't find any pieces of spacecraft, of course, or nuclear particles from 1908. But most scientists do now agree it was a mid-air explosion, probably about five miles high, caused by huge pressure building up on something enormous entering our atmosphere. But the oddball theories still thrive, and we were now landing in Krasnoyarsk to meet someone who apparently had a very distinct vision of his own. We were taken by the governor's personal PR to a public library in wooded parkland. One of the rooms held a small museum, which he promised would interest us. Because Yuri Lavbin was such a big local celebrity, the PR's son and several of his school friends had come along too. He took us up to his room and casually offered us his first surprise. Tunguska, 
The thing he was pointing at was just the largest piece in a room full of rocks. He'd found them all in the region, and most of them, he said, had characteristics of rocks from Mars. Just very... It's a Martian basalt. It's a Mars. deep Mars basalt. In that case, why is there still controversy? Love Bean then gave us his version of what had happened as the asteroid, or planetoid as he called it, flew over the Yenisei River. И когда уже перелетела Енисей, в это время ее просто сбил техногенный объект неизвестного характера. Something had shot up from Earth. Yes, and he'd found marks on the ground to prove it. He said. Так вот в этом месте 70. He pointed to the map to show the flight path of the incoming asteroid. У нас есть умение читать из космоса. And then picked up a photograph. This, he said was the place from where the intercepting spaceship had taken off. Uh -huh. and, the, and the, the, the way that it's been, um, you know, the, the metal is being put together is not possible on Earth. Uh -huh. And all this happened on June the 30th, 1908. And were the, were, the, were the aliens trying to protect the Earth then? И uh, это значит, что uh, инопланетяне хотели... Uh, не хотели, а спасли нашу цивилизацию от гибели. Uh, uh, они... So себе. just imagine, he's saying, if that comet had started burrowing deep into the Earth and had churned up all the Earth and all the comet itself, it would have covered the sun and we would have had no sun and long-term winter would have set in. If you ask me, our civilization was under protection. We were saved. I looked at the governor's PR lady, Liena. Was this guy really the region's foremost expert? And why had no one else found anything? And were these benevolent aliens still amongst us, we asked? Да почему они возле балкона могут летать? У нас красноярцы. I could see that Liena and the kids who'd come with her were enthralled. Her son Dennis started describing an incident just a week ago. Я глаза открыл и у меня перед окнами летал туда-сюда какой-то шар. Он был как ну белый такой, ну не сильно яркий такой, как ну такого прозрачного цвета белого. И из стороны в сторону туда-сюда летал. Ну, и потом, когда как ну мы с мамой подошли, он улетел. Мы уже легли спать, я уснула, и у меня сын подскочил и подбежал к окну. Я думаю, что там такое? Я тоже вскочила, подбегаю, я говорю, что там? Он говорит, мама. Я, говорит, думал, мне приснилось, почудилось, говорит. Я смотрю, по небу летает так в одну сторону медленно шар. Вот он действительно бледный, прозрачный, белый. Юрий Лавбин had one more surprise. Usually, he said, he was so taken aback when he saw a flying saucer that we'd be gone by the time he got his camera out. But on one occasion, he'd been lucky. Шел август месяц. Мои ребята ехали на теплоходе. В районе под каменной Тунгуски они увидели по берегу летит шар. If this is the Tunguska effect. There, in the room of rocks, I felt I'd reached its epicenter. There is a small band of devotees who've been to Tunguska nearly every summer since the 60s. 
We'd met some of them at Tomsk station a few days back. Alia, our friend from the library, has been there 33 times before. Slava Krivyakov is a younger generation. His mum was one of Alia's friends. Gosh. Yeah. He still does much of the trip on foot. How many kilometers? How many kilometers will you go with this bike? In general, 200 kilometers. Rather him than me. Plakhanov's wife Ludmila is the mothership of the enterprise. And what are your most memorable memories of the expedition? Well, I'm going home. In the regimented life of Soviet Russia, the forest became a sort of liberation zone, a place where they made the rules. The regulars formed a club called KSE, sang songs together, spoke their minds, and searched for answers to life. John and Larissa Anfinogenov were typical, obsessed by the puzzle and just about rising above the discomfort. Комары, пауки, это, это вот это самое трудное. Вот, ну, для, может быть, это для кого-то не так, но для меня вот эти вот комары, они заедают. The bonus was that it was too far off the beaten track for the party apparatchiks to bother with. They were all keen to crack the mystery, of course, but it was much more than that. Это был Ноев ковчег. Вот такое. Ощущение Ноева ковчега. То есть мы плывем. Разные, разные люди. Разные совершенно. Объединенные единым устремлением. Причем разные и по взгляду на проблему, да. значит, и так далее. Так, но объединенные устремлением Только, да. разгадать. Что сблизило нас? Скорее всего, это выношенная убежденность в том, что решение проблемы нужно в сегодняшней науке, что оно впишет несколько новых строк в книгу знаний. Sort of Woodstock with horse flies. The fall of communism has been a shot in the arm for the never-ending search, because foreigners can now join in. We've hooked up with two Italian scientists, Luca Gasparini and Romano Serra. They're members of the Bologna University team gathered together by Giuseppe Longo. They're going to take us to a place which they think holds the key to the puzzle. For most modern scientists, the argument has now been narrowed down. Either a meteorite which more or less disintegrated in a cloud of dust, or a comet, which had been largely dust and ice to start with. Both theories have problems, and for meteorite fans like the Bologna team, it's the absence of a crater that's still the biggest. We load the chopper with supplies for a night in the wild. 
eggs. So Those I eggs aren't for us, by the way. We're dropping them off for a group who had theirs stolen by a bear. We're heading for a small lake a few miles from the epicenter of the explosion. Lake Cheko, as it's called, doesn't appear on pre-1908 maps. The two scientists from Bologna believe it's because it simply didn't exist then. They think it was formed by a fragment of a meteorite landing down there near that cabin. The helicopter can't actually settle on the ground because it's too marshy, so we have to unpack in a rush. The Italians first came here nine years ago. They used a small boat left by passing hunters, and they need it now to get more evidence to back their theory. What they think is that a huge meteorite exploded in midair and that a fragment of it smashed down into the thick forest near this bend in the river. Water then flowed into the crater and formed a lake. What are you hoping to do this evening then? I want to see the trees that eventually were smashed by this impact and are now lying below one meter of mud. And, I mean, they... So how will you get to them? You'll dig down, will you? I, I, I cannot dig down, of course. I will, I will uh, take pictures of, of the bottom, mm -hmm. because I saw in the last expedition, in 1999, that there are some branches that drop out of the bottom. And filming it more precisely probably will allow us to, to decide whether they are normal trees coming from the forest or whether there is some systematic pattern that mm -hmm. could be interpreted as his machine that mm -hmm. I mentioned before. Yeah. The trouble is, we're having to make our own oars, and the bugs are awful. God, the mosquitoes are terrible, aren't they? Yeah, these are... It's horse flies. Yeah. What's your solution to them? Just ignore them. Yeah, you ignore them, but they don't ignore you, unfortunately. <laughs> Eventually, we're ready to launch. Uh, how old? Alexei, in the other know. direction. Hello. On their last visit, they'd used sonar devices to show that the lake was deep, sort of conical in shape, and unlike the shallow, flatter ones typical of the taiga. <laughs> That survey also detected something unusual at the bottom, which might just possibly be the remnants of a meteorite. This fucking animals. Yeah, oh. oh, terrible. What's that? GPS. Oh, great. And what will the GPS allow you to do? Just I position yourself? Yeah, I position the survey. Luca has bought a light and a camera, which he hopes will let him see what the bottom of the lake looks like. In particular, whether there are traces of trees down there. And how deep is the water here? Here is, I guess, about 40 meters. Oh, so this is quite, quite deep. 40 meters? Yeah. yeah. 50 meters is in the middle. Yeah. If there are just a few trees, it would mean nothing. They could have just rolled off the bank. But if there are lots, it would indicate a sudden catastrophe striking dense forest. All you scientists, I think, rather like having a gigantic puzzle like this <laughs> to solve, don't yeah, you? Yeah, yeah, you're right. But, you know, at the same time, we, we die <laughs> for, for discovery. You know, that's something which is contradictory, if you want. But it, it is like that. I mean, it's something you want. You like the mystery. 
you want to, to discover the mysteries, but at the same time, you die because it is a mystery, not because it's something else. <laughs> Oh, the trees! Yeah, no, don't move, don't move, you don't have to move. You see the trees? <laughs> they are there. I see. There, there are trees. Good. There are trees coming down of the... Yeah. Oh, I see. Yes. You see? Amazing. <laughs> so what do you think that first glimpse shows? That, that's our trees. There are trees everywhere, buried by mud. Now the, our problem is that we move a lot. Okay, great image. You see? Yeah. They are pine, pine trees. And, and what do you deduce from the existence of those pine trees down there? If, if they are everywhere, mm -hmm. it, it means that every, everything here is a bunch of trees smashed and collapsed. Yes. That was covered by a thin veneer or mud. You see? Very clear. <laughs> do you feel strange looking at a forest that was brought to an end? Hundred years ago. Well, I feel strange for other reason. What I they? feel strange because I, I'm here with four person in the middle of nowhere, <laughs> <laughs> just looking <laughs> for this, this instead of being in a bar drinking a beer. <laughs> I feel it a bit crazy, if you want, more than strange. <laughs> we move off. Luca wants to take soundings all over the lake to make sure the first one wasn't just a fluke. You see? <laughs> it's amazing. Every, everywhere you go, <laughs> you see this, these are trees. Yeah. You are witness. You, you all are witness. <laughs> but you've found the missing forest. Yeah. A few trees might have fallen down, yeah. but that many but not a have to be pushed down in but one. But not a carpet. It was something huge, you know, something totally not, not normal, not, not known. Light was beginning to fade. We made our way ashore and got ready for our first night on the lake. We have to keep food to the minimum. There are bears about and they can smell scraps a mile away. Next morning, it's back to work early. The weather can change quickly around here and they want to use every moment. Romana Serra's looking for trees that have already been damaged by lightning. He needs to examine the cross section to measure their age. Irregular rings usually mean something has happened to change growing conditions. He can also see whether there are signs of earlier damage and the direction from which it came. Very bad. Be bello, bello, bello. This is 08 near. Mm -hmm. And after, go in this direction, north. The, the uh, explosion, big explosion, uh, direction is uh, in uh, outside. Side. Side. <laughs> Promising. The ring suggests something big happened about a hundred years ago. And here's another one that looks interesting. It is, by the way, near the shoreline of the lake. And so, in case the lake was formed as an impact, should have suffered some bending. And it's exactly what Romano is going to see. What they're hoping is that the cross section will show more irregular growth or damage. But then a surprise. No obvious sign of anything unusual. This is trees which were alive in 1908. This was survived trees as well. But Romano needs more study to, to say something more. Not quite what he was expecting. No. That's typical of Tunguska. 
You accumulate evidence that points in one direction, then up comes something which doesn't fit. The answer, keep trying. Romano sets off to get more samples from the other side of the lake, while Luca and Alexei go back to trawl a section where a small stream forms a delta. By midday, the rain clouds are gathering. Luca and Romano decide to call it a day. There'll be more work to do back at the labs before they can confirm their findings, but they're pleased. There are lots of things that we have to analyze further, but they are promising. And for one day, it's a lot. But will it be enough to settle the argument? We're loading up for another trip to the epicenter. That's where tonight's anniversary party is. But the officials at the tiny airport, normally so easy going, have suddenly got difficult. While we're waiting, we spot an odd-looking group nearby. We go over to chat to them. They had news for us. He had a point. Just after seven was the actual anniversary. This wasn't going so well, and now I made it worse. What's the connection between the Tunguska incident and God? And off he went to sit with his friends by the stagnant pond. One of them said it was God who'd guided them together via the internet. But there was no time to find out more. Our problems at check-in were sorted and we were off. There's Slava, the man we met at the railway station. Must like that T-shirt. We all trooped off towards the Kulik hut. Hi. Hi, guys. Oh, look who's here. Hero of the day, it's finally. Me. <laughs> he finally shows up. You always see it. It's like, you know, a party. It's yeah. like holidays, you know. <laughs> it is. It's a holiday. Yeah. They'd all met at a conference in Moscow a week ago, each there to put his own special theory. This is Dr. Mark Boslow, an impact specialist. And are you kind of on the same track, or do you have a different theory? Or Well, you know, I, 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 I'm skeptical of, of this idea, but I'm also, but I'm also a defender. I, I think it's a good hypothesis. Decoded, that means he doesn't think Lake Cheko was formed by meteor impact. You know, the Russians are saying the same thing I am, so, yeah. I mean, we had... He's right. The comet theory is probably more popular nowadays. But the truth is that no one idea has ever had enough evidence behind it to demolish the rest. 
Suddenly Romano is getting excited. It turns out that some crucial bits of his evidence are about to go on the fire. They have called the telegraph pole. It was a, a tree that was standing very close to the epicenter or one of the epicenters, eventually. And it was totally deprived by branches and by the scorch. So it, this bit of wood that I'm pointing the camera at was right underneath the explosion 100 years ago. Era proprio sulle sull'epicentro. È molto probabile perché aver aver questa forma siamo all'epicentro. It is very likely. qua siamo già Well, you know, I didn't expect to see it in the wood pile. I want to take a slice of that home. But this isn't an evening for science. This was Gennady Plakhanov's moment. Дорогие друзья, сто лет назад именно здесь завершился свой полет космический объект неизвестного происхождения he more or less admitted he'd been making the same speech on the same spot to many of the same people for years Прошло почти полвека, но последнюю фразу можно повторить и сегодня. Ну и последний тост такой, мне фраза налить, выпить, запустить. За юбилей! За юбилей! За юбилей! Ура! Picture of an unhappy man. He'd come here to work, not play. Я скажу вам, как это я называю. У нас я один раз увидел этикетку, называется хвосты лобстер, имитация стунца. Вот это то, что здесь происходит. The day after the night before. Part of tidying up was dismantling the set. Which was how we found ourselves lifting off from Vanavara again, packed in tight with four reindeer and five of their minders. The weather was bad. We had to fly low over the forest as we headed back to their home in the wilderness. There was no airfield to head for. Just, we hoped, the telltale signs of their reindeer somewhere before our fuel ran out. The captain called for some help locating them. And suddenly, there they were. The nomads had materialized from the forest as fast as the reindeer were now disappearing into it. Where are the 
I felt like a time traveller. Okay, their clothes are modern, and so is the stuff they've brought back in those bundles. But I don't think Evenki life today is really so different from 1908. But unlike the enthusiasts I'd been with all week, they, without a doubt, have moved on. Perhaps they believe lightning doesn't strike twice. True down. Solid. Michele to fall there. Yes, I'm personally Pazoi. The linear pregnant. No, bull is trash and zrill. Что там еще? Что случилось тогда, чтобы был такой взрыв и такой шум? Ну не знаю, может подумали, что они такое уж, что боги, наверное, обиделись. I went into one of the tents. Did they live in them the whole year round, I asked. And she went on to explain the problems of keeping warm. The younger generation didn't have the same knack as their grandparents when it came to sewing reindeer skins, she said. And how deep does the snow get outside? Maybe we'd all be happier if we lived by the rhythms of nature and left the cosmos to the gods. But we don't, and the more we know, the more we seem to fear. Мы на грани этого страшного кошмара, который мы его предчувствуем, и поэтому, конечно, болезненный интерес ко всякого рода катастрофам. А для большинства они сводятся вот к упавшему камню. Поэтому вполне понятен гигантский интерес к тунгусскому явлению, в чем включая в него и ажиотаж, и интерес всех людей. И мне, мне видится в этом некоторое предчувствие грядущих катастроф разного рода. The scientists call the thing which descended on Tunguska a once in a thousand year event. Heading for home, I couldn't help thinking how different history might have been for the Tsar and everyone else if in the whole of time it had happened just a tiny bit later. If the Tungus meteor had flown 4 hours later, from Leningrad, nothing would have happened. I would not have been born. And maybe no Stalin, no terror, no goodness knows what. But one thing you can be sure about, this will happen again one day. If such a meteor is now going to fall on the Earth, it will destroy all of us, regardless of the borders, the politics, the party. That's why the scientists care. If they can understand what happened at Tunguska and then keep watch for the next thing like it, maybe they can save us. Somebody asked, but why uh, only today uh, people uh, are interested in this? Because uh, only today we have the possibility to obtain uh, results. Тунгусский взрыв вот этот, он призывает человечество немедленно заняться защитой земли от крупных метеоритов. Пока мы между собой будем выяснять, значит, кто у кого больше демократии, у кого меньше демократии.
это разнесет нас всех, и правых, и виноватых, без разбора. И ведь так что надо объединиться всем и решать вот эту задачу, как спасти всех. А потом можно опять между собой ссориться. The cargo is valuable, the ship itself has not been insured against piracy, and therefore the ship's owners are denying ownership and refusing to pay any ransom. The pirate leaders, who are estimated to have already spent around $1 million on the piracy operation, are refusing to back down, leaving little hope for the 24 hostages on board.